Okay, we're back. We're live with Global Connections uh, with Carlos Juarez in Mexico. Uh, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Catching Up with Carlos on all manner of things around the world. Welcome back to your show, Carlos. It's great to connect, Jay, and uh, aloha and bienvenidos, saludos from Mexico. Uh, as, you, as you just mentioned, they just want to reconnect as we do often and, and sort of maybe take a quick snapshot, a panorama. We live in interesting times, of course, and uh, there's no shortage of things happening in the world. But of course, the real challenge today is, you know, we've got a, a President Trump who is now, uh, well, facing just tremendous, tremendous pressure. And, you know, I go back to the fact that when he, um, the election night, I don't think he expected to win, and he certainly didn't plan to win and didn't have uh, uh, anything ready for the beginning of, of his presidency. And here we are now, gosh, approaching three years, is it? And, um, you know, we, we are just living in interesting times. Very scary. As some people say, the sauce is slipping off the linguine. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, uh, here I, I'm, 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 you know, seeing it in some ways from the outside. I don't know. The, I spent a lot of time here in Mexico trying to clarify and explain, you know, American foreign policy, American politics, the inner workings. And, uh, uh, you know, we are definitely at a, at a you know, very interesting time. Uh, even I want to just maybe refer a couple months back the the Pew Research Center, a well-known place for a lot of uh, survey analysis. They looked into sort of how Americans feel about the future. And it's a it's a pretty grim scenario. And then, of course, under you know some of these trends have been going on long before Trump, of course, but he's come in and almost grinding us uh, deeper into that. And it's uh, the reality that today the majorities of Americans see a weaker economy in the near term, a growing income divide. That's a hot issue, of course, for the election, a degraded environment. Uh, here we are, you know, with rampant development and, and inability to, to come together, uh, at least from the U.S., and, and support uh, climate change initiatives. And finally, a broken political system. Uh, we've seen the U.S. in crisis now for seriously since the moment Trump came into office and uh, democracy is taking a few steps back. Uh, we have a constitutional crisis now, don't we? The president challenging uh, the other uh, co-equal branch of government that uh, the way he sees it has no right to investigate him. And uh, uh, and so, you know, it's a showdown. Obviously, we're going to see it play out and it's in the court of public opinion. It'll possibly continue in the courts as it has been. Uh, and from the outside, it just looks very bizarre. Uh, uh, you know, appreciate that, for example, in Europe, most of the countries there have parliamentary systems that whenever there's a, you know, a presidency who, who comes under, or a leader, if you will, that comes under tremendous pressure, there are other ways of squeezing them out. For the U.S., it's a tremendous hurdle, the, the impeachment process. And we still have yet to see how that's going to play out in the, in the coming days. Yeah, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the press was wondering <clears throat> what is... Um, uh, defense was going to be, what, what his next move strategically was going to be. Uh, and then we saw a few days ago this eight-page letter, which really doesn't hold water. The only people who agree with that letter are the stooges that, um, you know, always say yes to him. And you're talking yeah. about his, um, you know, the, the people in his White House staff. Uh, he's managed to uh, fire or relieve himself of all those people who are rational and now everyone on his staff, in fact, his, his secretaries in his cabinet, um, they're all yes men or women. Yeah. And so uh, what, we have, what we have is a guy running a sole proprietorship uh, government in the United States who has, yeah. uh, as you said, you know, he's, he's um, created a constitutional crisis with co-equal uh, branches of government not, not functioning. And it's all his fault. He's, <clears throat> he's now stopped Congress. He's effectively yeah. stopped Congress. Uh, so and, you know, I, I don't know where we go from here, but it's not a good place. We're in a tight bind, of course, a, a continued uncertainty. But here, you know, as someone who I've long, you know, studied and taught about and lectured about transitions to democracy, that is how countries go from authoritarianism to democratic. Today, not in not only in the U.S., but in many parts of Europe and South America, what we see is a retrenchment from democracy or some version of it, some variation towards authoritarianism. Uh, and it's quite interesting, you know, when we often look at, let's say, military regime uh, crises, maybe the situation in Venezuela, the uncertainty there, uh, the cards are in the hands of the military. The moment that they don't continue supporting, you know, whoever that leader might be today, it might be uh, Nicolás Maduro in Venezuela. But what I want to say is that for Trump, the cards, his military is basically the Senate Republicans uh, until uh, enough of them, uh, what is the number, about 20, uh, to allow them to join all the uh, Democrats um can can agree to 
uh, an impeachment, uh, the president could well survive it. And, and I mean, it's horrible to think, but you know, there is a scenario where he could overcome this, the House could impeach him, the Senate could hold off, uh, and he muddles his way into the election next year. Uh, so the cards are in the hand of when, when, and we're seeing a few of them breaking off in recent days. Look at what happened in the past week or two with Mitt Romney, with a few others that are kind of uh, tentatively coming forward. Uh, and then you add to it the complexity. I mean, uh, you were describing what is his strategy. I mean, you can see it throughout his whole life. It's like throw chaos up in the air and, and you know, uh, become the victim, accuse everybody, uh, use the court system and public media, as uh, social media in his case, as best you can. But uh, boy, uh, you know, when you look at the most recent decision of, of Syria, his decision to pull out and, and basically create a vacuum for the Turks to come in, that's giving some uh, heavy criticism from some of his, you know, his current allies. Uh, is that going to be enough or will we need to see more of these Syrias before that can happen? Well, I want to I want to go around the world with you um, and uh, catch up with you on your mm -hmm. thoughts about these various uh, you know, places, problem places, hot spots, where, mm -hmm. hot spots that he has created yeah. or uh, that he has allowed to happen either way um, and uh, see what you think, but also what the, you know, what the people in Mexico that you deal with think and people at your university, uh, how they think and so forth and get, you know, get, get feedback on that. Because um, I think I think that what he does as a leader of the free world, I mean, I use the term very loosely, um, you know, has an effect on people everywhere. Um, and it's not only that he is reacting to a problem in a given place, it's that he's, in reacting, he's exacerbating the problem. So it's a spiral down, um, you know, yeah. to greater fragmentation and who knows violence. Let's talk about Syria first. Um, you know, from your point of view, Carlos, uh, from an international relations point of view, uh, what's going on with him and, and Syria and Russia and Turkey all together now? Yeah, well, these are, you know, just taking that snapshot of Syria, this is a very complex geopolitical, geostrategic, you know, many players. Uh, it's the Cold War, uh, you know, new version. Uh, but, you know, interestingly, when you look at American foreign policy or American negotiating styles, uh, many of the things Trump does have always been there, maybe in different degrees, different elements, and he has managed to take them all to the extreme. And what I want to say here is, for example, American uh, relations in the world, foreign policy, one of the characteristics or one of the ways they negotiate is in a sort of business-like, transaction-like. Uh, it's, it's a tip for pad. It's a, you know, uh, uh, using inducements and sanctions and, you know, pressure. Uh, well, Trump, again, does that, but he does it to an extreme and to a way that it begins linking things uh, uh, that are, you know, look what happened here. I mean, uh, he's pissed off a lot of, of, of who see him as betraying our longtime allies, the, the Syrian Kurds. And what does he go? He tries to rewrite history and explain, well, they never showed up on Normandy or something. Or Because, of course, some of these uh, Syrian Kurds are coming from Europe. Uh, they are you know, children of immigrants who've gone there or grown up in, in the West. But anyway, his distortion of history uh, is just mind boggling because uh, the reality is that suddenly now we've created the, the possibility of uh, prisons being broken out with uh, you know, ISIS uh, troops, uh, more and more massive suffering and refugees. Uh, and, and even Erdogan in Turkey threatening to send them all to Europe. And so, you know, we, we were here talking, Jay, some, what, four years ago when we had the massive crisis in 2015 of, of refugees. Today it's been managed. This Syria intervention, or not intervention, more sorry, the, the latest twist, and, and, and Trump is sort of giving the green light now to Turkey to take over that northern part. Now, in a strictly rational point of view, you can understand Turkey's interest. They want to seal their border. They want to control it. But the net effect is going to be, massive destabilization suffering and again uh, the u.s having fought against isis now is sort of letting this slip away uh, and that's why his own national security team state department defense department have all been flabbergasted by the impulsiveness of this uh, a phone call that he made to erdogan and then suddenly announces uh, over twitter you know that uh, we're out against the advice yeah. of his own uh, key players and obviously uh, so it is obviously it shifts the narrative a bit, and maybe that's his own thinking. If he even has that, if we give him that much credit, uh, he's sort of muddying the waters with shifting uh, some attention away from the impeachment inquiry to suddenly the Middle East. I, so I don't know dangerous! That, but, it's so yeah. dangerous. I mean, At he, the end he, of the he day, didn't compare notes with his Joint Chiefs of no, Staff. No, no, no. He didn't talk exactly. to the State Department. He didn't talk to Congress. Uh, he he this didn't is, talk. This is the danger. It's the most powerful uh, tool the president has to, you know, both affect sort of violence and war, 
Uh, and, and sometimes we do that by not acting or sometimes we do that by looking the other way or like in this case, because uh, the reality is the U.S. presence there was minimal. We didn't have, we don't have a big force, but it's there as a stabilizing force. And the simple decision to say, okay, now we're gone that quickly, caught, catching everybody off guard, what's it going to leave for those, you know, future allies that we're going to be looking for uh, in terms of the loss of credibility of yeah. our, you know, our word, the trust. Oh, they uh, must these think the terrible that... thoughts about us. One piece I caught is that there were ISIS prisoners being yes, held, yes, I guess, yes. uh, by, by, the, by the Kurds. And yes, uh, all of a sudden they, they were separated and no, nobody is responsible for them. So Trump has turned his back on those prisoners. Um, as far as he's concerned, let him go back into the wild. Let him go back and fight. I mean, what, what a reversal yeah. of fortune for them. But Britain came in. Britain, with the one with all the trouble about Brexit, they came in and they're saving Trump's bacon, saving our bacon, by taking over the responsibility for the prisoners, which is a, is a real statement about what they think about the leader of the free world. Yeah. No, it, it, you know, again, and we have to reiterate that even before Trump arrived, the U.S., uh, role in the world, its credibility, and, and especially after, you know, the events in Iraq and Afghanistan for so many years uh, have begun to, you know, erode a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, trust towards the U.S. There's always this healthy skepticism today. It's real. And, 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 and I guess, uh, you know, maybe to kind of put it again from the perspective of how do people see it or read it, uh, it's more unpredictable than, than, than usual. However, you know, from the outside world, the United States, here we go again. It's a hegemonic role. It's, a, you know, bullying. I, I mentioned earlier, there's like a business-like maybe mindset about the U.S. There's also a hegemonic superpower. And, you know, the U.S. is in a new world today. And some some people understand that it has to be more nuanced, more maybe, you know, cooperative, if you will. Uh, for others, we're still living in a world that maybe in Trump's worldview of the way it once was, where the U.S. did call the shots, had respect and, you know, was listened to. Uh, today, I think it's fair to say that increasingly we are not, uh, and, uh, and while we remain a player there, uh, we are not able to call the shots the way uh, uh, it was done in previous times. Yeah, he's a laughing stock in Europe. He must be a laughing stock for all this. He didn't consult with them either, and and they're definitely parties to the problem, uh, and and maybe parties to the solution. But he didn't even talk to them. So my question yeah, no. to you, Carlos, is you know what happens now? And this is a very hard question because he's unpredictable. And he's still a feature in the environment about what happens. Um, but you have uh, all these other players. And, and now it seems to me like it's anybody's guess what kind of violence and, and uh, you know, destruction we're going to see in Syria going forward. What do you think? Do you have any uh, expectations? Uh, you know, uh, uh, there, there, there was a comment made in the press, and I think today uh, Trump addressed it, that he is saying that, well, they, they all want to go to Europe. Let them go to Europe. Well. You know, it's not that simple. Uh, obviously, if there are, you know, people getting out of prison that have been, you know, had an interest in, in harming us or our allies, uh, it, it, it hurts all of us. Um, beyond that, I would just say this. Here we are almost three years now into the presidency. And I think uh, as people from the outside world see, and what I'm speaking of, there may be elites or political leaders, uh, they both sometimes understand, but often don't, the U.S. electoral cycle, the calendar, uh, and that's a whole nother story because nowhere else do we see basically campaigns for, let's say, our presidency that go on for what seems like years. Uh, we, we've had this ongoing primary. Uh, the election is still more than a year away. Uh, and yet maybe a sense <clears throat> for some from some adversaries, I'm thinking here, whether it's China, maybe Mexico, maybe others in Europe, there's almost a sense of, well, do we wait it out? Do we wait to see? And, and here the uncertainty today is this current crisis of uh, the impeachment. Mm. Uh, it could happen very quickly. It could be a matter of weeks and, and maybe uh, Trump resigns or he manages to survive it and muddle his way through to the election. Um, you know, people are continually asking, do you think he'll win? Well, again, it's anybody's guess. There is certainly a potential scenario where he could get reelected. But I have to guess that uh, what he's doing in most recent days and his own temperament he can't be winning new converts. So it's a, how, how deep that so-called base is and will they show up to vote, will they mobilize? I just can't imagine that he's gaining more support. Again, when you even look at the, the reaction of many of the Republicans, uh, the number of Republicans who are leaving Congress and choosing not to even run, uh, and, and in some cases potentially losing uh, more to the Democrats. Well, again, uh, so from the outside, even though not everybody understands, let's say that calendar, there is an awareness that somehow uh, it's a process that, uh, you know, you could white out. And again, I'm just thinking of a trade negotiator. Do you really 
put all your eggs in and in, in, in make this massive deal? Or do you somehow write it out and see what's going to play out in the next few months, given, mm. given the current political crisis? Yeah, I, I, yeah. When you when when you talk like that, I think uh, there's really no way you can predict anything anymore. Uh, could happen anywhere, no, no, no. anytime. You just know it's not going to be good. Let's talk about China for a minute. You know, yeah. uh, you can say that they were taking advantage of us for a while and all that, um, but Trump has made has exacerbated the relationship, uh, undermined any possibility of a future relationship with them uh, beyond recognition. We're we're at a trade war, except it's it's only him doing the war, uh, yeah. and you know my my feeling is uh, we we should be concerned because China is reacting, and China is getting ticked off at us, and the man in the street in China who used to like Americans doesn't like Americans anymore. We're heading to a yeah. cold war with China. No. Yeah. Well, it is, and and this is a war of Trump's choosing. Uh, the Chinese, uh, in some ways. Uh, taking the long, long, you know, horizon view, and also, curiously, almost paradoxically, you know, such a different world today. Imagine, you know, a generation ago, or, or you know, we recently celebrated 70 years of the People's Republic of China. Certainly, a, a you know, a Chinese person that's 70 year olds today has lived through quite a bit of change. And what I mean there is that today, China in 2019 is essentially the defender of the free trading modern international system while you know Trump is the you know chaos master of of, <laughs> uh, of just you know destruction and breaking yeah. whereas the chinese are are the ones that are the even keel now having said that the reality too is that they are also deeply deeply engaged everywhere else in the world and and in a way that is eating our lunch that is uh, in africa and in south america in australia they are the primary sort of development uh, player and, and obviously extracting the resources they need, but uh, they are taking on a, a global role that's quite interesting, uh, you know, whether we call it a state-led imperialism or what, I don't know, but uh, they are today, and I often tell this with my students, you know, because over the last 30 years that I've been both teaching and, you know, seeing maybe delegations of Chinese, you know, 30 years ago, they were pretty rusty and maybe, you know, newcomers to the world. Today, uh, a negotiating team of, of trade, uh, let's say, trade negotiators from the government or any number of other delegations that you see around the world, they are savvy, they are experienced, they know the language, they know the culture. They probably know more about the electoral system than Donald Trump does in terms of, you know, the dynamics. And even uh, as, the, as the trade war goes on, they're playing the game that has long been U.S. politics of targeting districts and you know, obviously making sure the pain is felt so that uh, the pressure can be on. So fascinating to see, again, this China of today and, of course, the U.S. chaos and, and, and you know, weakening and, and relative decline. Uh, it's 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 not. A, but it's yeah. definitely a trade war. Uh, we saw it play out. I haven't even read all the full details, but in the last few days with the NBA now as, as you know, an integral, usually sports are bringing people together. Now it's creating an added tension to the U.S.-China relationship. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I think the operative thing is uh, you said that China was uh, eating our lunch, and I think it is eating our lunch. Or uh, we're we're asking them to eat our lunch, and they are eating our lunch. They they want to do that. And the one belt, one road is an initiative that is really it's all the way from uh, Beijing to uh, to Spain. Um, they're going to have uh, a road there and uh, shipping lanes there. Um, as a result, they're going to have enormous economic leverage in every continent. Uh, so mm -hmm. what's really remarkable is that we're not doing anything to countervail on that. Over okay. time, and given their long view of things, over time, they will dominate the world. They will dominate us. And maybe they wouldn't do it in such a moral way that we were doing it, to the extent we were doing it in a moral way. Um, but they will have power. And, and, yeah. and so what's really tragic about this is that the, the sun is setting on the American empire. And you can see yeah. it happening every day. And my question to you is, where does this all go? Because right now, uh, we're, we, we have, we're still crowing about our economy. We still have a low unemployment rate. We still have a lot of jobs that are coming online. Uh, we, um, the market is, uh, although it's been volatile, it's still pretty much up there. Um, and he, he crows about that. But bottom line is, and in discussion about recession, it ended. It, you know, everybody was all interested in recession three weeks, a month ago. Now he's just quiet as you can hear the crickets. Uh, so yeah. I'm really, what, what is going to happen here? It sounds like it's, it's building up so, to a huge crescendo. And one day we're going to see the, the drums roll on the American empire, no? 
Oh. Well, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it is, again, hard to say, hard to predict. And while we, we can speak of this rising China and its tentacles everywhere, and they are very strategic in that regard, but it's a very strategic sort of for building their, their pie, let's say. I, I think where we probably want to be careful, and I, I don't maybe pretend to understand fully the Chinese you know, mindset and foreign policy, but I don't know that they have geopolitical or, or maybe strategic interests in the same way of, of empire. It's a different kind. But, but most certainly, they're going to be a player to contend with. And uh, in some ways, they, they're shifting the, 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 the power towards them more um, and building these alliances and ties. Uh, but it's not easy and it's not all positive. Even you know the very ambitious uh, One Belt, uh, One Road initiative you mentioned, it's also got a lot of criticism that uh, China's interests are so focused and narrow uh, and uh, you know they've taken a lot of criticism for treatment of, of different places uh, where they've come in, uh, and uh, you know they're going to stumble along the way as well. But uh, nevertheless, they, they they've got both the long, long, long horizon and vision. They have the patience. They're not rushing. But if you look forward, let's say thirty years from now, yeah, they're going to be a key player, uh, and um, and the U.S. will continually find itself having, and at least right now, losing trust, credibility, legitimacy, so that. While it's going to have a seat at the table, it's not going to be taken as seriously as it used to be. And, and boy, we're going to have to eat some, some humble pie to be able to, to stay alive. You know, well, we could talk about Mexico, and we've talked about Mexico and south of the border before. It's, a, it's actually a gruesome conversation. It never gets better. It always gets worse. Uh, he does things that are unethical, immoral, and outright crazy unfair. Um, and so I'm, I'm skipping that for this discussion, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know it's pretty much the same as it was, but worse. What I would like yeah. to cover, though, is something you mentioned earlier, and that is Brexit and our relationship uh, through UK and into, and into uh, you know, Europe, continental Europe, um, because I think that his position or maybe lack of position these days, his lack of engagement, his lack of mm, helping anyone uh, and only hurting them with his anti-NATO talk, uh, and the the, mecha, the, 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 um, the machinations that he's engaged in uh, in, in uh, Ukraine only only hurts American influence there, and only hurts them, the Europeans. But can we talk about Brexit and what he's done or not done, and what is likely to happen, both in the initial you know withdrawal from the EU, uh, and then of course in what follows? Yeah, and and again, here we are waiting a few weeks for this drama. We've been spending a lot of time in the last few years trying to make sense of it. Um, I think what we see in, in, in the case of the UK also is a very serious political crisis, a crisis of credibility, legitimacy. There was a time where traditionally the, the two leading parties, uh, you know, the Labour and, and Tory, had a pretty clearly defined agenda and, and maybe policy platform. And today that's also kind of eroding and, 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 and you know, the, just the, the, the nastiness of it and the polarization. So, where does that leave them? And, and on one hand, let's uh, assume a scenario where they do leave, and maybe it's bumpy or rough. Uh, yes, there is an opportunity for the U.S., given the, the longstanding ties of the special relationship. But at the end of the day, I can't help but think that England, uh, Scotland, Wales, uh, they are so interdependent, interconnected uh, with Europe uh, that uh, it, it can't be but a cost, uh, a pain. In other words, no winners. Uh, who are the winners? I mean, maybe some American firms can benefit over time uh, entering more into the UK market, but that's not going to be easy or without its problems. Is the UK going to flood the US? Of course not. It's a smaller economy than, let's say, the rest of Europe, uh, where we get more goods from. Uh, so I don't know. I, I, I think just like in the US, we're going to be continuing a, a few more years of uncertainty. Uh, in the UK, they're going to need to probably transition even to a post-Boris uh, world because while he's there now and he may survive this uh, this exit transition, the Brexit, uh, I just I don't see him as a you know prime minister for the next ten years like uh, you know mm. like someone someone who's going to really yeah. boom make the country boom. So they're yeah. going to be languishing along. Uh, there's going to be deep divisions internally. You know, Scotland wanting a, again to split off, or and you know maybe what's going to happen with the Northern Ireland? It's almost like the easiest solution, frankly, would be just let them reconnect with the rest of Ireland and 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 call it call it quits. But uh, of course, easy for an outsider to say that. These are very emotional, sensitive issues there. But, uh, you know, yeah. I, I also think that for the EU, it has been a crisis, but it also, I think, curiously, it can present an opportunity. The rest of the 27 remaining 
can kind of rally, uh, kind of redefine who they are. And I suppose make sure that they will make it painful for the UK because you don't want others to suddenly defect. Uh, you know, the Poles or you know maybe the Italians. I mean, no, no, it's not it's likely totally we're going to see that. Uh, but but I think there's a scenario where maybe the remaining EU 27 can coalesce and reaffirm and whatever. You know, maybe with more modesty on one hand. Uh, but in the end, the, the UK was always a skeptical player, a skeptical member. It joined in the early 70s when was always with like one leg out. Uh, and so uh, my sense is for many other Europeans, it's like, well, get lost. You know, you were never really in the inner circle anyway. Mm. Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, uh, the economies are deeply intertwined. And, you know, England and London in particular has always been a very important global, uh, international and European city. Uh, but it is, I think the Brexit is damaging its overall uh, economy, reputation, political system, and so it's a lose-lose. Nobody's no, who's winning from this. Well, one last uh, thing we should talk about is, and uh, I think it's sort of overarching somehow, is, is Russia. Uh, mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin is feeling his stride these days. Uh, he's uh, he's creating trouble everywhere. Uh, his main purpose in life seems to me to uh, un undermine the United States in every way he can. And, uh, it, you know, the claim has been made that, that uh, Trump is his agent, uh, works for him, that, or that he has stuff on Trump that makes Trump a marionette for him. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, he's having great success in fragmenting Europe, fragmenting NATO, um, yeah. and, and becoming, um, you know, uh, a, a real global troublemaker. And I wonder, yeah. I wonder where that goes. I mean, uh, you know, we've had the Mueller report. We, we still have investigations going on about Trump's role in our elections and, and his strange, let me say it again, strange relationship with Trump. But where do you think that's going? Where do you think Vladimir Putin is taking us? And isn't he a global, a global factor right now affecting just nearly everything? Yeah, well, it is. And, and he very much has his own tentacles in different ways, whether it's through this sort of energy markets or just this, you know, in the last 20, maybe now almost, practically 30 years since the end of that uh, you know, Soviet Union, we've created a new class of oligarchs, uh, these wealthy uh, Russians who you know, are spread out and, and, and they've got tremendous influence in the UK in particular, but other parts of Europe. Uh, and I think it's like everything, as long as those that have that power, the economic power, the political power, uh, the connections there, uh, they sort of feed themselves and, and then just continue this, uh, well, this, this uh, elite uh, oligarchy. But I'm reminded as well, you know, I can remember in the mid to late 80s, uh, you know, there was a pretty much a widespread prevailing view that the Soviet Union was this, uh, you know, un you know, would never end. It was so powerful. And when it fell apart, it was like a dick of cards very quickly within a matter of, you know, weeks and months. And you'll recall this coup and then Gorbachev disappears, comes back, it's gone. What I'm getting at there is that we have an image of Russia being very powerful and Putin, the strong guy. But, you know, it's not inconceivable that you know, some scenario, maybe of an economic or political crisis, could suddenly bring that deck of cards down. Uh, could it be pressure from below? I don't know. I mean, I have a feeling that uh, that's kind of uh, run out of steam in some ways. I don't see a big social movement uh, making the change. It's probably more crisis at the top. But for now, we can expect probably continuity. But again, I'm just getting back to that. You know, we can't assume that it's all going to be forever that there, that there could be a right. real crisis yeah, a world there. of change uh, yes, a world of yes. change and, and maybe in a funny way a world of decline but talk about running out of steam carlos we have just run out of steam <laughs> we're out of time <laughs> i so enjoy these conversations yes, i hope we yes. can do it again in a couple of weeks and, Absolutely. and revisit the world as will have been changed from then till now <laughs> yeah, that's right never a dull moment in, in you know global affairs it's uh, we live in interesting times absolutely yes thank you so much carlos suarez we'll talk to aloha. you soon aloha <laughs>